Book of Ephesians in the fifth chapter. Ephesians in the fifth chapter. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to begin reading there in just a moment. Ephesians chapter 5. And this is this third part of uh, biblical manhood and womanhood. We've been looking at this now and um, working our way through some thoughts from the scriptures. Um, three important truths that we're going to get to. We already talked about two of them. We're going to get to the third one tonight. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse number uh, 22. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 22. And uh, we're going to read down through verse uh, number 33. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. And the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So we've been looking at three uh, important truths concerning biblical manhood and womanhood. We started with, a couple weeks ago, the truth that uh, men and women are created by God, and they're created with equal dignity. They're created with equal worth in the sight of God. Last week, we talked about the fact that man and woman have been created with different roles, different roles, and those roles do not at all call into question uh, man or woman's dignity or man or woman's worth in any way. They don't, they don't call that into question. So thirdly, this evening, we're going to look at this third thought here, uh, and then in subsequent uh, messages, we're going to deal with some practical things uh, about these truths. We're just laying some groundwork here. So third thing is this, God created men and women as a reflection of the Godhead or of the Trinity, if you will. In other words, God created man and woman as a reflection of himself, who he is. So this is where you see the beauty of equality and the beauty of difference, uh, both. God exists, uh, we believe that God exists, according to what the scriptures teach, he exists in three persons, correct? There is one God, it's not three gods, there's one God in three persons. So there's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Ghost. So think about the very personhood of God, okay? We're talking about man and woman created as a reflection of the Godhead, a reflection of the Trinity. The persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, are equally divine. They are equally divine, each one. In other words, is the Father God? Yes. Is the Son Jesus Christ? Is He God? Yes, absolutely. Is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost of God? Is, is He God? Yes, without question, all three. All three, co-equal coexistent, eternally existent, right? All persons of the Trinity are equally divine. All of them are of equal worth. Uh, all of them are equal, uh, uh, equally worthy of praise. They're equally worthy of worship. They're equally worthy of honor and glory and adoration. Yes. None is, is higher in worth than the other. None. They're equally divine. But at the same time, think about this thought, at the same time, the person of the Trinity are positionally different. They are positionally different. They have different roles. 
They have different roles. Now, this is, this is clear through the Scriptures. Think about it. The Father has authority over the Son. When Jesus Christ was on this earth, what did He say? I do always those things that please who? The Father. I do always those things that please the Father. So the Father sent the Son into the world. God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them who were under the law, right? That's what the Scripture says. God the Father sent the Son into the world. The Son is obedient. He does always those things which please the Father. So He's obedient to the commands of the Father. Uh, Jesus said this, John chapter 4, verse number 34. My meat, you remember the setting... The setting was Samaria, right? The setting was the disciples went into the city of Sychar to find food. And Jesus sat thus on the well. And he talked to the woman that was at the well. And he led the woman that was at the well to himself, right? And then the disciples come back and, and uh, he says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And they're like, well, who brought him food, right? Who brought him something to eat? In John 4, 34, Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So the Son is subject to the Father in the Godhead. Uh, the Father has authority over the Son, and the Son is subject to the Father. The Son sits where? He sits at the Father's right hand, right? He sits at the Father's right hand. We see that uh, through the Scriptures. Look with me in the book of Romans. Hold your place here in, in uh, Ephesians. We'll come back here in a little while. But go to the book of Romans. Look at a few passages here of this evening. Move around just a little bit. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Forgive me if I kind of move quickly. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse number 34. Romans chapter 8, verse number 34. The Word of God says here, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even where? At the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Uh, go to the book of Hebrews for just a moment. Go to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, and uh, verse number 3. Book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, and it's talking about Christ, Jesus, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He sits down at the right hand of the Father. First uh, Peter, first Peter chapter 3, first Peter chapter 3, verse number 22, who has gone into heaven is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So, who is at the right hand? The Son is at the right hand of the Father, not the Father at the right hand of the Son. The Son is at the Father's right hand. 1 Corinthians eleven three says, remember we read this scripture last week, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is who? God. Now that doesn't have anything, anything to do with the fact that they have equal dignity and equal worth. Positionally though, one is head over the other. The father's head over the son in a way that the husband is head over the wife. That's the whole picture of headship, the whole picture of submission. So is that a bad picture in the Godhead? Is it, is it domineering of the father? Is it chauvinistic of the father? Is it, is it offensive to the son? No, not at all. No, it's good. You see, we get so programmed in our day, in our culture, to think authority is evil. It's evil. It's domineering. Submission is, is negative. Or, or somehow submission makes, makes a, a person inferior. But that's not true. Look at God. See Him. See the authority in the Father. See the submission uh, in the Son. Neither of them inferior or superior. Neither of them domineering uh, or, or denigrate one another. Together as one, loving and, and, and being loved, leading and being uh, led. The son never goes to the father and says, you know, you've been reigning for, uh, for eternity past. You've been reigning since eternity past. Well, why don't you give me a try? No, there's, there's glad submission. There is loving authority and glad submission in the context of this relationship. It's always been this way in the nature of God. It's always been good Always been good. 
So our ideas of authority, our ideas of submission get distorted in our culture, in our day, in many ways, because of what? Because of sin. The effects of sin. But we can't just throw out God's design because of the distortions of our culture. To balk against authority, to balk at, at submission, is to balk at the very character of God. Uh, to believe what's been pushed in our day, to say that authority and submission, uh, uh, that picture is bad, is to say, I believe the culture and not God. One writer put it this way, we can say that then that a relationship of authority and submission between equals with mutual giving of honor is the most fundamental and most glorious interpersonal relationship in the universe. He goes on, such a relationship allows interpersonal differences without better or worse, without more important or less important. And when we begin to dislike the very idea of authority and submission, not the distortions and abuses, but the very idea, we are tampering with something very deep. We are beginning to dislike God himself. Authority and submission are good. They're a part of God's good design in creation, a part of the very nature of God himself. So that leads us to this, three conclusions, three conclusions concerning biblical manhood and womanhood. Number one, all of this is good for us. All of this is good for us. Go back to Genesis chapter 1 with me for just a minute. Genesis chapter 1. Look, look back at the beginning here of the creation when God created. In Genesis chapter 1, verse number uh, 31. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 31. This truth that we've seen, all of this is good for us, good for man, good for woman. Why? Both are created in the image of God. Both are created with the likeness of God. Both with different roles. But Genesis chapter 1 verse 31 says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was very good, the way God designed it. And that's expressed clearly in God. The beauty and the wonder and the oneness seen even in the Trinity between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. This is, if you will, unity and diversity. They're attracted to one another there's diversity there. There's differences, but there's unity. So think about that for just a moment. All this is good for us. First of all, unity in diversity. We are attracted to one another by our differences, right? Man and woman, different. It's good that we're different. It's good that we're different. Oh, it's challenging at times, yes, but it's good. What makes it good is we're not the same. We're not the same. Our differences is what makes it good. If, if, if in the relationship uh, that, that, uh, that I have with my wife, if we were, we were both the same, if, 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 ever, if, if we were both like me, boy, that'd be terrible. <laughs> be terrible. No, what, what attracts me to her? She's different. She's different than me, right? She's not like me. So that leads to something else. Not only uh, unity and diversity, but equality amidst intimacy. In other words, we honor one another as we enjoy one another. We honor one another as we enjoy one another. We honor one another how? As equals. Equals. We experience intimacy through differences. It's scriptural. Look at Genesis. You're there in chapter 1. Just jump over to chapter 2, verse number 24. And you find this repeated in the passage we read in Ephesians. Paul repeated this, he quoted really from this passage. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Our unity with each other is found at points where we, most, or we are most different. That's unity, diversity, and equality right in the middle of intimacy. We honor one another as equal while we enjoy one another's differences. And thank God for this union. Thank God for it. From that one flesh union, from that one flesh union of husband and wife as God designed, the most astounding thing in, in, in this world happens, in this physical world. What is it? It's the creation of another human being who's made in the image of God. 
That is decidedly good for us. Why? That is the design of God. It is good for us. All of this is good for us. Number two, all of this is glorifying to God. All of this is glorifying to God. Well, how? In, in what way is it glorifying to God? Well, several ways. First of all, we reflect God's character. We reflect His character. The Trinity is reflected in this relationship between man and woman. Think, of, think about man and woman. Man, as we've already said, man in his God-given role as head and woman in her God-given role as helper both declare the glory of God, both reflect the character of God. How so? Well, God is our head. God is our head. He shows that it is good for us to have loving authority over us. It is good for us. It is good for us to submit to that loving authority that's there. So we are to submit to his authority as head at the same time to know that our head is also what? Our head is also our helper. Go with me to the Psalms for just a minute. I can remember as a, as a young person singing this psalm. Psalm 121. Psalm 121. Psalm 121. I'm not going to sing it for you tonight because I'm going to mess up the round and we're supposed to start and stop and go to the next verse and all that. Uh, we sing it as a family, but I let my wife lead that <laughs> so we don't mess up the music part of that. Uh, Psalm 121 and uh, verse number 1. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My what? My help. Now notice verse 2. My help cometh from where? The Lord, which made heaven and earth. So we see both facets of the character of God. He's head and he's helper. It's both reflected in the uh, a man and in the woman, right? Head and helper. If we, if we undercut that, if, if we ignore that, if we disregard that, well, what are we doing? We're missing out on seeing the character of God that he wants reflected in us. He's designed us this way for a reason, head and helper. Okay, so we reflect his character. Secondly, secondly, we trust his word. We trust what the scriptures say. So this is an area, as many areas throughout the word of God, the Bible comes up, totally against, cross-grain, the patterns of our culture. Totally opposite direction. And so now we're forced to make a decision, right? Are we going to believe the Bible? Are we going to follow the Bible? Or are we going to side with the culture? Which way are we going to go? Are we going to trust the culture that is present in our day that, that, that says personal worth and and personal roles, they're, they're, linked, they're linked together. And if you have a different role, that clearly diminish, diminishes excuse me, uh, your worth. If the roles aren't equal, that diminishes your worth. That's what the culture says today. But we come back to the Scriptures and your worth is not found in your role. Your worth is not found in your role. Your worth is found in the fact that you've been created, male and female, in the image of God. So am I going to trust what God has said, what God has laid out, who says that we have worth because we are made in His image with different roles for His purposes that eventually exalt Him? Who am I going to believe? Who am I going to trust? Either the Word and its, uh, its authority or the ideas of the culture. Which one are we going to, going to hold to? Well, may God help us to trust His Word, even if it goes across grain with the culture in which we live, so that we can reflect His character. We can glorify Him as men and women according to His design. See, all of this, all of this is good for us. All of this is good for us. All of this is glorifying to God. Third thing, all of this is the essence of the gospel. All of this is the essence of the gospel. So the foundation that's laid in Genesis chapter 2 is not coincidence. It's not coincidence. It's not happenstance. 
No, it's very purposeful in the plan of God, how he outlined it. Now, back in Ephesians 5, we read it just a moment ago. If you go back there, if you held your place there, uh, put a bookmark or your finger there. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 32, the Bible says, This is a great mystery. This is a great mystery. In, in Genesis 2, what was going on, all this, this is a great mystery. Now, when he says mystery, when Paul says mystery here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 32, he doesn't mean it's Sherlock Holmes, you know, elementary, my dear Watson, I've got a mystery to solve. That's not what he's talking about. Not something I've got to try to, try to figure out. I've got to get my uh, magnifying lens out to figure out what's going on. He means it's something that's hidden here that will be uncovered, that will be revealed more later. And that's what he's doing. He's uncovering and he's revealing the picture for us in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, what does he say? He says that man was created this way, woman was created this way. Male is head, female is helper in the design of God so that this relationship between man and woman there would be a clear, a visible picture of God's relationship with his people, Christ's relationship with the church. Spells it out here in Ephesians chapter 5. This is where we realize that, that manhood and womanhood is, is much greater than just how it affects this or that in our lives. No, it's much greater than that. It, it's, it's a divine drama on a divine stage where God has chosen to create man this way and woman this way and marriage to look like this, as he spelled out here in the Scripture, so the world would see a loving picture of a groom and a bride. It's a picture of Christ and His church. Why do, why do you think... Why do we think today that dev, the, the, the devil and uh, the demons that, that follow him, why do you think they're in an all-out assault on the family? Let's do everything he can to mar the picture that Christ has outlined. Everything he can. Men, we are to be a, a groom that, like our Heavenly Father, is trustworthy to lead a bride well. And ladies, you're to be women to be a, 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 a bride that loves her groom well. Christ is our sacrificial groom. The Son of God came at the, at the bidding of the Father. Came to do what? Came to be obedient unto death, even the death on the cross, the Bible says, to save us from our sin. But the Bible describes him as what? A groom. A groom. That makes it possible for us to be his submissive bride in a relationship where we live to serve him, to be a helper to him. We can trust him as our head to lead us and guide us well. And we find our life, what, in submission to him and to his will. That's the whole point. That we would see Christ and his relationship with the church in a man and woman in their relationship in, in marriage. This is why when you see Scripture like this, and you understand the truth that's behind this Scripture, and you have an opportunity, as you see it in your mind and heart, and you realize that this is the truth, this is the way that God has outlined this is what He has said in His Word, and you have opportunity to push back against the ideas and the policies in our culture that threaten to undo this. Why? Because you know there's something much more at stake. There's something higher at stake. The, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is on display in a picture of man and woman together. And we fight that truth with that truth with zeal. God has designed the headship of men and the help of women to display the glory of Christ and the salvation of the church. And we want His glory known. We submit our minds, we submit our hearts, we submit our lives. We embrace the complementary differences between man and woman because we know that a right understanding and practice of biblical manhood and biblical womanhood is essential. What's it essential for? It's essential for passing on the gospel to the next generation. How are boys and girls and young men and young women 
to see the gospel in us if we undercut the very picture of God in man and woman and in marriage. It's essential that we take these truths and we embrace these truths. All three of them, man and woman, created equal in dignity, equal in worth. Man and woman created with different roles that don't call into question the dignity or worth in any way. And then man and woman created as a reflection of the Trinity, as a reflection of the Godhead. All of this is good for us. All of this is glorifying for Christ. And all of this is the essence of the gospel. See what is at stake and take a biblical strong stand for the Lord in these areas in these days. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, you've outlined it for us. I'm glad that you have not left us without guide and direction. Uh, Lord, you have given us what we need. All that is needed to live a life of holiness and godliness. You, by your Holy Spirit, abide with us. We have the strength, not in and of ourselves, certainly not. But we have the strength because we have you abiding with us. Now, Lord, help us to see anew and afresh these truths. And then, not just to see them, but then, Lord, to put them into practice, to live them out. Now, Lord, I pray now that you would help us daily... Lord, as we see these truths being denied, as we see these truths being suppressed, Lord, I pray that we'd speak out boldly for you. In love, of course, but boldly. Speaking the truth in love. Guide us and help us, we pray. Lord, as the days that we live in get more spiritually dark, help us to shine brighter. Help us to live brighter lives, brighter testimonies of influence in this day in which you've placed us, this opportune time of all times, this opportune time that we have, possibly at the end of this age, to tell others of you and to represent you well in this hour. Help us to do it, we pray. Bless the families, bless the marriages, the homes of this church. Help us to be the homes and the marriages that we ought to be for thee. Bless now, give us wisdom as we share requests one with another. Give us wisdom to know how to pray as we ought to pray concerning each need. We ask these things in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Well, amen. God bless you. Uh, I don't have any uh, special requests that um, were turned into me before the meeting. And um, I'll look on here on the social media to see if anybody has uh, sent anything in while we've been meeting here. Does anybody um, have anything right now? Any requests? Yes, Brother Neil. Okay. Okay, so pray for Vernon Corey and uh, doctor appointment tomorrow, he said? Yes. Tomorrow. And uh, knowing what disability he's going to be receiving there. It's been, been over a year since uh, he's had these health issues, so do be praying for that for tomorrow. Uh, Lori Singles sent in here that she has an unspoken request. So, pray about that. All right, others. Nancy. Okay.
Okay. So pray for Nancy's son, Lee, and uh, Nancy Rogers. Son, Lee, is going to have a heart catheterization on the 29th of this month. Is that correct? 29th of this month, 29th of July. So pray for wisdom there. And then pray for Cindy Sheets as well and uh, seeking that she needs a, a knee replacement and um, looking to get some disability help there for that as well. So do remember Cindy. Yes, Dawn. Pray for Don's brother, Mark Newcomb, and they found some more tumors there on his brain, so pray for him as he goes through this treatment. Pray for strength there for him. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Lynn Ipoc, is that what you said? Okay, Lynn Ipoc, and uh, let's see, is this out in um, Missouri? Yeah, Sunday school teacher for Pat's uh, sister out in Missouri, had cancer surgery, uh, kidney, and uh, so pray for him and healing there and wisdom for the doctors as well. Lynn Ipoc. Okay. Any others? Yeah, one, Dean. Amen. Pray for Brian, and this is someone that Dean's had an opportunity to witness to, and he's shown interest in Christ, so pray for his salvation. Okay. Very good. Any others? All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer then. Oh, wait. Sorry. Just got one that came in. Uh, pray for Jeffrey, Jeffrey praying. He finished his IV steroids, and he thinks his sight is a little better. He's going to continue on the oral steroids another week or two, so please continue to pray for his healing. That came, came in from Kathy, so pray for Jeffrey. All right. Any others? Anything at all? All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, then once we're concluded praying, you are dismissed. Appreciate you being here. Uh, God bless you. Trust you have a good uh, rest of the week.